I love superhero movies, especially those origin story movies. You know, those are the ones that explain where did the superhero come from? How did he become the way that he is? Well, this fall, we are looking at the origin story of Jesus. Where did he come from? How did he become the way that he is? We'll see what Jesus was about before his official ministry started in the sermon series, Firm Foundation, the origin story of Jesus. Believe it or not, your origin story begins with Jesus as well. You see, as we learn from Jesus' story, it will shape your story, making it more exciting, more fulfilling, and more adventurous than ever before. Join us on Sundays this fall for our series, Firm Foundation, the origin story of Jesus. Learning about Jesus' forerunner uh, uh, named John the who? Baptist, that's right. And today we have a sudden shift. Luke actually makes a very sharp and, and sudden shift, unlike the other Gospels, in that as we uh, read about Jesus' baptism, John's name is not even mentioned here in, in Luke. Isn't that fascinating? It says the, the, now the attention is 100% on Jesus. And so as we take a look at this text, uh, let's first pray that God would illuminate his word into our lives. Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that as we encounter your word, we actually have an encounter with you, with you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God. And we pray that as we encounter you in these just brief verses, we pray that you would be at work in our own lives, transforming us and inviting us into a deep and meaningful relationship with you. And Lord God, we know that you will do this because we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is Luke chapter 3, verses 21 to 22. Let's, let's now listen to God's word for us. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So who in your life would you say is particularly close to God? Maybe you wish you'd be close like that. That person seems to hear God's voice. Like in that, text. They, that person uh, seems to have those spiritual encounters, very real spiritual encounters with God, like in our text and they enjoy that divine connection with God, that, that deep peace and full joy and active love. And oh, you long to have that too. To fully breathe, to fully be yourself, and to fully enjoy God's thrilling goodness and deep care. And yet, maybe, you feel that God often seems, well, impersonal. More like a math problem to figure out. How many of you out there are really good at math? How many of you enjoy math? Yeah? Yeah? When I grew up um, as a young kid, I was good at it. I didn't really like it. But then I came to love it later in life, of all things, in statistics, by the way. So uh, <laughs> I see Karen Lincoln. So, but out there, you know, little Jeremy would not have raised his hand. He did not like math. He did not like it at all. I actually came across little Jeremy's story this past week in my own notes. And so I know I had him and uh, used him before, but I came across him in my notes. And I thought, I got to share this today. You see, Jeremy's parents tried everything for him, from tutors to special classes. And Jeremy just did not get math. And finally, even though they had no church background, they finally enrolled him in a strict Catholic school known for doing math well. Well, immediately his parents noticed a change. 
as soon as Jeremy got home from school, he studied until dinner. And then after dinner, he went back up to his room uh, and studied until bedtime. (laughs) So his parents were astounded by his earnest studying. And then finally, of course, after several months, finally Jeremy's report card arrived. They were all anxious to look at it. His parents opened the envelope. They skimmed down the page. And they were overjoyed to see that he got an A in math. And so they called Jeremy downstairs. They said, Jeremy, we are so proud of you. We are so proud of your math grade. What is it that worked? What is it about this Catholic school that did it for you? And Jeremy said, when I walked down the main hall that first day of school, and I saw the statue of that man nailed up and all bloody on that big plus sign, (laughs) I knew this school was serious about math. Yes, God is serious about math. I mean, he's particularly serious about a particular math equation. I might call it a math problem. And this math problem is a problem you probably have heard of before. God is serious about math. He's serious about the math problem we call the Trinity. God is one and yet three. One and three, three in one God is one being, yet three persons. But how does that make sense? One equals three, three equals one. And the Trinity sounds like an unsolvable, cold, difficult math problem. I was thinking this past week, it's like Schrodinger's God. Three, yet one. Singular, yet a plurality. Opposite realities that cannot both be and yet are. But... I mean, we long for a God to be relational, joy-filled, and loving. Not a, not a cold math problem that we can't solve. Amid lives of uncertainty and conflict, we need a caring God, not a calculating God. How can we understand the Trinity? Why does the Trinity even matter? Why, why is this confusion here? Well, as you see in our scripture, today's story is all about the Trinity. Beautiful story. Jesus is the Son of the Father who speaks from heaven as the Holy Spirit descends bodily like a dove. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Luke's Luke's version of Jesus' baptism is actually unlike the other three Gospels' version. Um, Actually, in Luke, I would say... Uh, it's not about the baptism at all, like in the other Gospels. In Luke's version, it says Jesus had been baptized. That was sort of background. And Jesus was praying. As a matter of fact, I wonder if in Luke's version, we shouldn't call it Jesus' baptism, but Jesus' prayer. Because that's when the action happens. And in Luke's version of this, it seems like it's a, well, it's a private scene between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The voice from heaven addresses Jesus directly. And it's as Jesus prays. Now, this is a beautiful Trinitarian picture that Luke paints for us. But it seems like a private scene. What about us? And what does the Trinity have to do with us? If we're looking for a firm foundation in God, how do we fit into this Trinitarian math problem? This equation makes God seem theoretical and distant, not caring Well, as as Christians, I hope many of you know we have, well, many foundational verses, but one of our most foundational verses in all of Scripture is a verse that we call the Shema. The Shema is actually Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And hopefully this sounds familiar to you. It goes like this. It says, it's simple. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. See, as Christians, Christians are what we would call monotheists. We are monotheists. We believe in one God. That is a foundation of our faith. And yet, 
like in today's scripture, God is revealed in three persons. Say them with me. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, I hate to tell you this. It may sound scandalous, but the word Trinity is found nowhere in Scripture. And yet, the Trinity is everywhere in Scripture. We see it all the way from the very, very beginning of time, even before the beginning of time. We see uh, the Trinity there in, in Genesis. It, it, it's present in the Genesis creation story as creator, you know the story, creator, and then the spirit hovering over the face of the waters, and then the word which is spoken, and that word eventually becomes flesh, if you know the story. And then it also appears too, Trinity also appears back in the Old Testament as well with um, Abraham and Sarah. Maybe you know that story as well. God appears to Abraham and Sarah as three people, three men walking there toward them. And of course, bringing Sarah laughter, if you know that story. God appears as three people. And then, of course, in the New Testament, we see that all the time. I love this particular verse, and it is more of a language thing here, but, but Jesus tells us to baptize, and the language is in the name, and that word is singular, in the one name, but then he names three of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One name, three persons. Trinity is throughout all of Scripture, and we struggle with the Trinity. We struggle with this Trinitarian math problem, and we try to get at this problem through analogies. And I bet some of you have heard of some of these Trinitarian analogies. I'm going to just share three of them with you this morning. And I like all of them, but they, they do help. Um, number one, the Trinity is like a three-leaf clover. How many of you have heard of that one? Yep, the three-leaf clover Trinity. Yep, some of you have. Uh, that, uh, the three-leaf clover is that uh, they're all, it's all one plant, but it has three separate appendages, basically. Second one is the Trinity is like the sun in the sky. That's a nice analogy too. See, this, there's the sun itself, and then there's the rays of the sun, and then there's the warmth of the sun. How many, has anyone heard of that analogy? That's another, that's another helpful one. Okay, yeah. The third analogy, Trinity is like water. And this might be one of my favorite analogies. The Trinity is like water, which has three forms. Water can be liquid, or it can be a solid, as in ice, or it can be gas, as in steam. How many of you heard of that one? Anyone? Yeah, okay, a good number of you have heard of that one. I like that one too. These analogies are all really helpful, but here's the hard part. They all fall short. They simplify it way too much. As a matter of fact, if we push on any of these three analogies, we actually run into heresy. Let me explain. So number one, the, the, the clover analogy can become the heresy, if we push on it, it becomes the heresy that we call tritheism. Each person of God is not a separate leaf or separate appendage, so they're ultimately intimately involved with one another. The second analogy, that sun analogy, it becomes the heresy that we call subordinationism. Subordinationism. God didn't start out as the Father and then eventually produce the Son, and between the two of them, they generated the Holy Spirit. No. Each person of God is equal, not subordinate, and they have always existed together. Now, the third analogy, that, that water analogy, which is kind of one of my favorites, but if we push on that, the water analogy is the heresy that we call modalism. God doesn't morph into different characters. If so, God could not be in relationship with himself, like we see in our scripture text today. That'd be God just kind of talking to himself. No, that's modalism. So we don't believe in that either. Gosh, you know, one, one pastor said that the problem with the Trinity is that if you don't believe it, you will lose your soul. But if you try to explain it, you'll lose your mind. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, our triune God sounds like an unsolvable math problem. But we need a God who cares, not an equation to solve. And so as we wrestle with the Trinity, 
I think it helps if we can take a, a glance backward a little bit into our uh, church history. There's a theologian named Gregory of Nazianzus. He was in the fourth century. He struggled with the Trinity, as I hope we all do. And uh, as he struggled with it, he coined uh, the word perichoresis. It's a Greek word, perichoresis. And this word was later expanded on by John of Damascus in the 8th century. I am so grateful for those two theologians. You see, this beautiful theological word, perichoresis, describes the relationship between the three persons of God, mutually indwelling one another. You know, we, we think of often the Trinity in terms of the roles like creator and redeemer and sustainer. Uh, but each member of the Trinity is involved uh, intimately in the, in the activity of the other two. So this is a great word, perichoresis, moving in unison, yet as separate active persons. It's actually to, to grasp the meaning of perichoresis uh, if you understand what the word itself means. So here's the little etymology there. Peri, uh, perichoresis, peri is a word we actually use in English all the time, like in the word perimeter. Uh, perimeter. Peri means around. Perimeter means to measure around, right? So that's peri is around. And the last part of the word is choresis. Again, we use that in English as well, as in the word choreography. It means to dance. So peri choresis means to dance around in a circle dance. Our triune God is a perichoresis God. The Trinity is like a three-person dance of unity weaving in and out with complexity and precision and joy and freedom and unity as one God. What a great image. So what does this perichoresis of the Trinity have to do with you and me? Well, Luke paints this picture, and I believe God uses this scripture text today as a picture of the divine dance. We see them dancing together that we might get swept up into the dance as well, like a wedding dance. One of my favorite photos, my all-time favorite photos, is a photo of my wife Paige dancing with my dad at our wedding. See, I invited Paige into a relationship with my parents when I married her. And that picture is a beautiful favorite of mine because she and my dad in this picture, they are looking at each other in each other's eyes. They're smiling with joy and fun as they dance. <laughs> My love for Paige invited her into my family. And so she danced with my father. My love for Paige invited her into my family. And so she danced with my father. Friends, that's what Jesus does for you. <laughs> His great love for you invites you into the divine dance with the father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit sweeping you off your feet. That's what our text is telling us today. It's not a math problem. Our, our relationship with God is not drudgery or duty, but dance. That's how Jesus' origin story becomes your story, by daring to be swept off your feet by the divine dance partner. And that's why the doctrine of the Trinity matters. It tells us a relationship with God is not drudgery or duty, but dance. It's not a math problem to solve, but a God to enjoy. You know, this past week, at our church board meeting, we call it the session, if you don't know, at our session meeting, our youth director, Matt Heisler, shared about youth ministries with us. And at one point, he showed a video to all of us, our elders and pastors there in this board meeting. He showed a video of their, what they called their schools out dance party. 
And it was hilarious. <laughs> so the kids dressed up in these uh, blow-up puffy outfits that made them look ridiculous. And they just started dancing around to the really fun music. And it was just so entertaining to watch. And uh, as we were watching that video, I turned around to look around the, the session table to look at our elders. And every elder in that meeting had a goofy grin on their face, watching the joy and plain fun of the high schoolers dancing. And then Matt said something biblically and theologically significant. As we were looking at them dancing, he said, that's not the fun in order to get to the real ministry. That is the real ministry. You see, the dance itself is the ministry. Enjoying God is the ministry. Everything else we do, and even the wonderful, is a part of that. Everything else we do, even the Bible studies, even our committee meetings, believe it or not, even, even the, the worship we do, even our pledging, all of that serves to invite others into that irresistible, joyful, and frankly fun, divine dance. I thank the youth for reminding us to be dancing fools, enjoying God to the fullest. You see, the Trinity, friends, is perichoresis. It's this divine dance. It's not a math problem. A relationship with God is not drudgery or duty, but dance. And Jesus' origin story becomes your story as, we, as you are swept off your feet. So are you longing for passionate joy and deep peace and immense love? Well, there's good news. Christ comes to us. Christ in lovingly invites you into that dance. So say yes to the dance by inviting the divine dance partner into your life. Say yes in baptism, yes in prayer, yes in communion, yes in supporting ministries, yes in sharing your faith with your neighbor. Say yes. And then today, go out these doors and into the world dancing. Because a relationship with God is not drudgery or duty, but dance. So friends, embrace the real origin story of Jesus. He's inviting you into the divine dance. And it'll make your, your story more exciting, more fulfilling, and more solid than ever before. Because he will give you a firm foundation. And so, Lake Grove Church, let's dance. Amen. Just dance.